and we talked about what it's going to take to get there. And it might be surprising that we didn't really talk about anything visual yet. Uh, a lot of our topic, uh, discussion was about visually what makes a page a good, um, you know, what, what makes it a good, a well-designed web page or a well-designed website. Yet none of our discussion really concerned visual aspects of it yet. We talked about things such as goals and, and personas and the user goals and our goals. All right. The reason for this is, again, if you think of all the visual things that we're going to put on our site, the use of fonts, the use of colors, the use of white space, all those things relate to making it a more meaningful experience for the user, making it for a better experience for the user. Now, what do we know constitutes a good experience for the user or a better experience for the user? Well, if they achieve their goals. So for us to know, for example, we're going to, you know, we know to use color to identify things that are important. All right. Well, that's well and good. We can state that as a design principle. We might use color and we might use other typography things such as fonts or, or uh, you know, decorations such as underlining or borders or whatever. So we know that is a visual statement, is a visual statement of design. But we really need to go and not put the cart before the horse and say, well, what is it that's going to be important for these users? So that's why we start out with this. A lot of the things that we're going to do visually relate very specifically to the things that the user wants to accomplish. And therefore, we better have a very clear sense from, for this. This might sound like, you know, it's overkill or that is obvious, but I don't really think it is because I think too many people go into a website without really thinking through what their audience is after in addition to what they're after. And both those things are, are critical in, in making a, uh, uh, an effective website. And therefore, taking the time to define the goals and defining the personas, you know, representative of people, um, typical users on your site, I think is important. So our first step is to define the goals. After we define the goals, then we define the requirements to achieve those goals. And believe me, I'm not much of a split hair person, you know. Sometimes what one person considers a goal, another person considers a requirement or vice versa. Do keep in mind that goals relate to what people want to get out of the site, whereas requirements are the things that you're going to put on the site that is going to help us achieve those goals. All right? And to be sure, there's a little bit of over overlap. Goals tend to be more strategic more long-term, more general, where requirements are more specific and um, relate to practical, practical nuts and bolts. What are we going to do? What are we going to put on the site to, to get our job done? We'll notice this as we go through the process. We start out very vague, talking about goals. You know, might sound very lofty and, and conceptual and theoretical. Then we move down to requirements, which is a little more grounded and a little more concrete. And then we move down to the next steps. Let's see. Uh, our overall structure of the site. Um, what the skeleton of a page is going to look like. What, what the general layout of each individual page is going to look like. And then finally, what the pages are going to look like. Prototype versions. In other words, working, working model of the site. So we're, we're getting more and more specific and more and more tangible as we go through this process. Now, I'm going to say a truism here. All right. Every goal ought to be supported by at least one requirement. All right. And every requirement ought to map to each goal. Or I'm sorry, ought to map to some goal not necessarily to each goal. Uh, I don't think I can, I'm sorry. The, 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 the statement was is to, to repeat those two lines, and let me do that. Every requirement 
should relate to at least one goal, and every goal should be supported by at least one requirement. All right. Let's give some examples. All right. Um, our goal might be, we said, our goal might be to increase sales 10% in 2013. That might be a goal that we defined. Well, that's hard to read. Oh, that's a lot better. Goal might be to increase sales by 10% for the next year or something along those lines. That might be a goal in launching a website. What are some ways we could achieve that goal through our website? What are some things that we could do to achieve those goals? Okay. One is to increase traffic. In other words, get more people to visit our website. How could we get more people to visit our website? Okay, a promotion. What would be an example of a promotion? Okay, um, so, so some buy one, get one offer. What would be another example that, uh, of, a, of a different kind of promotion? A uh, free shipping offer, coupons, special internet sales, all right. The idea here is the goal is really like why we're doing all this. The requirement is what we're going to do to try to achieve that goal. You know, it gets back even to, you know, in business or even in military, they talk about strategy versus tactics. The strategy being what we want to achieve, the tactics being the steps that we're going to take to try to achieve that. All right? Your goal might be to be a web developer. All right? Your tactics might be to take classes at LC, to do some volunteer work for a nonprofit organization to build your portfolio, to build a personal website. Um, those may all be steps that you take to achieve that goal. Now, there can be a lot of different ways that you achieve a goal, right? One way that we said that we could increase our sales would be to offer some sort of promotion. And even when we talk about offering a promotion and advertising a promotion on our website, we could take a few different approaches of different kinds of promotions. We could do other things, too. We could try, for example, to um, have a contest. All right, I guess that's another kind of promotion. We could add interesting or compelling content to our site, such as games. You know, the thought being that if people visit our site to play a popular game or something, oh, while they're there, they're going to look and notice and, and possibly buy something. The point is, is the strategy is what we want to achieve. The tactic is or requirement is the steps that we're going to take, the things that we're going to take to do that. Now, um, our goal might be um, at LC might be to get the community more involved by having, by drawing more visitors from the community to our college. That might be a goal, all right? A tactic that we could use to try to achieve that would be maybe to publicize um, non-credit class offerings, maybe to publicize cultural events, maybe to publicize sporting events that are on campus, and so on. Those are all things that could help us achieve that goal. Now, again, you don't want to take the shotgun approach, you know, and say that, gee, you know, 
we're going we're gonna to do this and we're going to try every approach necessary or, or possible even. That's not a good idea. Again, by, 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 by judiciously picking your tactics, that will um, make for a more successful site. It's not to say you only take one tactic to achieve each goal, but again, you don't throw everything but the kitchen sink at the goal either. All right? Few things to keep in mind just in general terms. Strategies are typically long-term, whereas requirements or tactics tend to change a little bit over time. All right? Every company always is going to want to increase their sales. That's always going to be a goal for every company that sells something. Right? But the specific means that they take to achieve those are, are apt to vary over time. And there's apt to be some flexibility in that. All right, so let's get back to the statement that I said that was confusing. And let, let me try to write it out. So I can confuse you not only with the spoken word, but with the written word as well. Every requirement should align with one or more goals. Every goal is to be supported by at least one requirement. If one of our goals for a BANS website, for example, is to increase attendance at our live performances, and there's nothing on the site that addresses that. There's no mention of our live performances. There's no schedule. There's no anything like that. Then we miss the boat, right? Because we've taken one of our things that we've decided is one of the most important things that we want to achieve, and we haven't done anything to achieve that. That comes along to every goal that we have must be supported by at least one requirement. Now, a goal may have several requirements associated with it. Um, for example, you could, um, you know, a, a band that wants to increase attendance to their live events could have videos of past shows to get people interested in coming, along with a schedule, in which case those two requirements that we will have videos of our past performances on the site, that we will have a schedule of our upcoming appearances on our site, both those requirements would align with the goal of increasing attendance because they both address that. In addition, a requirement may match with several goals. All right? And that sort of gets into the second part of this, whereas every requirement should address at least one more goal. If, for example, we're talking about a site and we say, you know, getting back to our band example, and we have a list, um, and, and one of the things that we have on there, um, I'm trying to think of something dumb. Reminiscences of the band members about when they were in junior high. All right. If that doesn't relate to one of the goals, then you should get rid of it. All right. Why? Well, because it's clutter. All right. We want to be very focused on what we're doing here. And therefore, if it doesn't add to the purpose of what we're trying to achieve, if it doesn't add to our purpose and help us achieve one of our goals, then toss it. Now, in some cases, again, you know, especially with bands and depending on the kind of band and all that, Sometimes they put personal information on that just because fans of the band find that compelling. And that, that creates a closer bond between the fan of the band and the band. They, they like fake, you know, get to know the members of the band. And that, that actually makes for better fans and makes for better consumers of their goods. So I'm not saying in all cases would that be irrelevant. But if that's not one of the goals, 
to sort of give insight into the band members' past and, and forge a bond between the fan and the musicians and so on, that's not one of the defined goals, then you should probably get rid of it. All right? We want to be brutal in cutting stuff that's not relevant to our site. All right? Why do I say this and why do I stress this? Well, again, the tendency of people, all right, the natural tendency of people, the natural tendency of people developing websites is to try to stick too much stuff there. All right? The thought being is if 10 things are good, then 20 will be twice as good. And that's not the case. All right? It's not the case because those extra things serve the potential or, or have the potential risk of becoming a distraction. All right? If you have a whole bunch more stuff on your site, you need a whole bunch more complicated navigation scheme. A whole much more complicated navigation scheme, then it's going to be harder for people to find the stuff that they're really interested in. So it's a case, again, of, you know, don't try to satisfy every possible question that you think the website might be, be asked for, but handle the, the, the typical ones, handle the obvious ones, handle the big wins for your organization, all right? I kind of gave the example last time of um, typical things that someone might want to study or, or, or find out from a college's website. Like someone, a new a, a prospective student enrolling, all right, or a new student enrolling, would want to be able to register for classes, be able to find out when the classes are offered, and do all those things. Now, there might be a case of someone coming in that maybe has worked in the field and wants to see if they can get some credit for some of the courses, but that's not most people. That's one of the primary goals. So you may provide information like how they can contact to get other questions answered, but you wouldn't necessarily say, well, you know, for some people that would be a goal. Well, is it one of the prime goals? Is it one of the main things? And ought we have resources on the site devoted to that? If not, Maybe, again, make the easy things easy, make the hard things at least possible. In that case, maybe provide a, a person to contact for other inquiries concerning classes and getting credit for classes and so on. That might be a, a reasonable approach. Requirements are typically simply a list of things that are going to be on the site. All right. You know, every... If we look at LC's website, not necessarily holding it up as a perfect example, but just for demonstration purposes. One requirement might be the site will contain a class schedule. All right. Okay. The site will contain a class schedule. The site will contain information about financial aid. The site will contain information about what events are happening on campus. All right. These are all statements of requirements. You know, the academic calendar will be listed showing um, important points, important dates throughout the semester. All right. Every one of these things is a requirement. At this point, you're essentially just listing the requirements. Now, as you can imagine, you know, for, for a big site like this, there's going to be a whole bunch of requirements. You're not expected to have really that many requirements. You're expected to do a smaller page and, you know, a dozen or so requirements probably would be adequate. A dozen good requirements. All right. Again, the important thing is, is everything that you put on the site should relate to one of the goals that you've defined. And every goal that you've defined should have some requirement that matches up to it. All right? The goal is, or, or the, uh, the, the requirements list is largely an undifferentiated list. In other words, we're not talking about organization of the material yet. We simply list what's going to be on the site. How we're going to organize that material is going to come in the next step. So we don't necessarily stop and think about, gee, 
are we going to have, say, a separate page for new students versus a separate page for um, non-traditional students versus a separate page for community members? We don't think about that just yet. All right? We just list all the stuff that we know we need to have in our site to help us achieve the goals that we want to have. Questions about this? All right, what's next then? Next is the structure part. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk about this a long time, and then I'm kind of going to give you the answer for your project, but bear with me and, and listen to me ramble for a, for a few minutes anyhow. All right. Sites can be structured all different kinds of ways. And again, when, especially when you come into larger sites, that really becomes important. All right. Let's think of an example, and let's talk about a sporting goods store. Let's say we were creating an online sporting goods store. What are some ways that we could organize our products? They don't have to be good ways. Let's just brainstorm about ways that we could organize the products in a sporting goods store. We could organize them by color. Well, how else? By sport. So we have the skiing stuff in one place. We have the golf stuff in another place. By color would be interesting. Again, I said no value judgment, but we have all, you know, we have all the black things over here. So whether it be golf shoes or, um, you know, tennis wristbands, they're all over here. Okay. But again, we're brainstorming. Uh, sport. All right, very good. We, we would have all the ski stuff over here, all the tennis stuff over here. Be another way to do it. Okay. By some combination of gender and age. All right. Adult versus children, male, female in each. That, that would be a reasonable way to do it. Size, maybe. Okay. Big, all right. Yeah, let's, let's jot these down. Size. Um, beginner. We'll call that the level or the skill level of the person. Anything else? Don't have to be good ideas. Price range. Price range. Consumer ratings. All right. Maybe the top rated items. Maybe the brand. Okay. We came up with these. All right. And one thing I'll say is we have a little bit of an advantage on the web than you do in a real physical store as far as categorizing, uh, categorizing items. What is the advantage that we have on the web versus in a physical store? Okay, we can certainly show more products. That's one advantage. You can allow the user to their shopping as opposed to physical store. Okay, great answer. See there? See that? There we go. See? All right, great answer. The advantage that we have is that in a physical store, we're probably stuck with one level of categorization. For example, in Blockbuster, all right, uh, I don't, there probably aren't Blockbusters anymore, are there? No. All right, well, there used, to be, there used to be this store in the 20th century called Blockbusters, and they rented videos, and you would go into the store, and they'd have sections for new releases for comedy, for horror movies, for action movies, and so on down, kids movies, and so on down the line. The problem is, is a movie could only live in one department, right? And there can be an overlap. So for example, if you have a movie that maybe crosses boundaries, like Shrek. Shrek, I guess you could consider that a kid's film, or you could consider it a comedy. I mean, I thought it was funny. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, all right? 
Great movie, right? Is that a horror movie or is that a comedy? Yes. Yeah, yes it is. In a physical store, you have to make those decisions about categorizing it, all right? Which means that if I go in thinking it's a comedy, I might not be able to find it if I'm not smart enough to go or it's less convenient. Online, I could put it in both those categories. In addition, as you said, I could change the approach then and search for it another way. Maybe if I'm really puzzled about how to categorize it. Um, anyone see Barton Fink? I've seen that movie three or four times and I couldn't even tell you what it's about. I couldn't even tell you what genre it's in. It's one of the Cone Brothers movies. If you uh, did, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah, you know, and all them. Well, Barton Fink, I have no idea what kind of movie you'd call that. All right? But I could look it up by director online where I wouldn't have the luxury to do that in a store. Now again, does that mean that all our problems are solved? Because the web is infinitely flexible and we could allow people to search a whole bunch of different ways. No, because then again you run into the difficulty of giving too many options confuses people and they're not going to know where to begin. So you do have the advantage in saying, well, we have a little more flexibility in a web environment than we would in a, uh, a physical store. And we, we can take uh, a couple of approaches. We could overlap things such as categories or whatever. But the temptation again is, well, if we can categorize it two ways, maybe if we can categorize it a thousand different ways, it will be even better still. And the answer to that is typically no. You know. More is good to a point, then more becomes bad. All right. Now, we're going to keep things simple for our example because we really don't have that many pages. Uh, but the most important thing to do is when you're deciding how to categorize things, don't think of it the way that you or the organization thinks of it, but think of it in terms of how your persona is going to view it, how your personas are going to view it. A classic example of that is, and I haven't, I haven't played around with our new website to see if we have this problem or not, so I'm not talking about LC's website necessarily. But a lot of websites for schools are organized based on the college's departments. You have the business division, you have the arts and humanities division, you have math and sciences, you have health, you have engineering and all that. Well. I understand that's how our college works, and I understand, for example, that if I wanted to look up int uh, information about our um, computer gaming classes, that those are in arts and sciences. Is it obvious that they're in arts and sciences? No, it's obvious to me because I work here and I see the memos and, and all that. To someone coming in from the outside world, though, that doesn't make any sense. Or, or I, I won't say it doesn't make any sense. It's not immediately apparent. It could be in a couple different places. You could have a computer gaming curriculum in arts and humanities, for example. All right? And that would also be reasonable. But as it turns out, it's not. And there's reasons why it is, but none of those reasons are important to people looking for that information. Those are all dealing with the internal way that the college is run. And the people on the outside don't know that and don't care about that and shouldn't have to learn it. All right? So therefore, Having a site that was organized more from the user's perspective of, gee, I'm a high school student and I like computers. What are my options here at Loring Community? I don't care what division offers it. You know, I'm not sold on going to the business division or the engineering division or arts and humanities or math and sciences. But tell me what my options are because I like computers. I want to work with computers. So a page that would be based maybe on interest as opposed to the way our college is organized would be important, all right? <coughs> so always look at it from the perspective of your personas, not from the inside knowledge of, of, uh, of the organization.
All right. The, the basis on which you categorize things is called your organizing principle. All right. So for example, getting back to our sporting goods, it would seem of these, at least as far as the top level categorization, because remember, we could actually categorize a couple different levels. But as far as the top level categorization, eh, these two probably would be the, the, the most reasonable approach. Because anyone coming in knows that they want golf clubs and not ski poles, right? They should know that. They might not know what brand they want. <coughs> they might not even be sure what size they want, all right? Um, and so on. But they're definitely going to know the sport, and they're definitely going to know information about themselves, you know, how they fit as far as gender and age go. What do we call this overall basis? Organizing principle. It's the basis by which you classify things. Now, it, it really is, this really is a whole science, you know. And it's not just with computers or, or websites. Uh, the whole science of information architecture and information science and, and all that gets into this. Gets into things like taxonomies, right? Taxonomy is a way of classifying something, all right? For example, you know, as far as living creatures, plants and animals, right? And there's an organizing principle between a plant and an animal. What's the organizing principle between a plant and an animal? How do they choose to categorize living creatures into those categories? A plant and an animal. What? No, be between a plant and an animal. In other words, we've got a shrub there and a cat here. We look and say, that's an animal, that's a plant. How did we decide that? How, how come they're both not plants? How come they're both not animals? Not really. If I'm not mistaken, you, the, the organizing principle is whether they make their own food or consume other food. Uh, plants make their own food. All right, animals consume other food. All right, so that's the organizing principle. They could have organized it different ways. They could say all green things are one thing. So then some parakeets would get lumped with plants, right? But that's not a useful way to categorize based on color. All right, it would cover most of the plants, but again, not all of them. It's not a useful way. So whenever you're deciding this, when you're deciding the organizing principle, you've got to think of what's useful and specifically what's useful to your audience, your personas. And that's the organizing principle you have. Now, there's all kinds of different ways that you can organize this. And for the most part, you guys' site, and here's the answer, where those of you watching at home, you could have fast-forwarded to this part, all right? Um, most of your sites are going to be simple hierarchies where you have a home page that's sort of the main landing point for everyone. You then have some pages underneath it. And then maybe you have some pages underneath this. So for example, you know, let's say I have a very small sporting goods store. I could have my home page, I could have apparel, equipment, and shoes. And underneath apparel, I can have golf and softball. All right? Or did I say apparel underneath equipment, I meant. I could have golf and softball or whatever. Your, pay, your, your site design, your structure diagram is likely to look like this. Now, you still have choices to make. All right? I haven't given you the answers. Your choices are what makes more sense. To have a diagram that goes wide where essentially all of your sub pages are on the same level 
or do I have a diagram that goes deep? That maybe off our main page I have a couple alternatives. Underneath each of those alternatives I have some alternatives. So, this might be two different ways you could have a structure chart for about the same number of pages. One of them is wide, one of them is deep. Again, what gives you the answers to this? What gives you the answers is putting yourself in the shoes of your personas and saying, how are they going to view this? For large organizations, for example, when I did a faculty fellowship at NASA, I, the, the developers, the internal web developers, talked about de developing their internal website. All right? As you can imagine, anything dealing with government work, there's like paperwork for everything. You know, there's paperwork so that you get the right paperwork to fill out to get your vacation request or whatever. All right? And therefore, a lot of time was spent by people just looking for the right forms online. Well, they decided it would be worthwhile to, to reorganize that portion of their website, their internal website. So what they did is they came up with a couple different prototypes and organized a couple different ways and said, okay, let's pretend you want to request a vacation. Where would you go? Well, I go to the home page, then I go here, then I go here. And either they found the form or they didn't. And if they didn't find the form and had to back up, that was considered like a failure. If they did find the form, that was considered a success. And they're able then to go and look at and see, not just with one person, but with a number of people, and get an idea what the better way to organize the site is. Because they can actually then see and test how their users understand the data and how their users in their own minds organize the data in which case they can make their site match that up all right and, and organize it yes is there a... um that's real hard to say because when you get on really large sites you know that could be a problem you know I, i've heard people say two or three clicks but that is you know, it's pretty unrealistic, yeah. Um, you just want, how do I want to say it? You want to do the best job that you can organizing it. Really, my own personal take on that is the, the number of clicks are less of an issue than the number of retries that I take. So if I start at a home page and I'm looking for something, and I click on, this, on a second page, and I click on a third page, and I click on a fourth page. And I have to click on ten different pages. If I finally make what I want, that's okay. The problem is, is if I go click on the first page, second page, third page, fourth page, realize I've taken the wrong path, and then have to go back and start again. So I guess that's my take on it. You know, um, you can't make you know, you can't make things that are complicated always as simple as we'd like them to be. You can make them as simple as they can. But in my perception, the number of clicks are, are less important than the number and the frequency of false starts. You know, or the number of times people uh, try to find something, throw up their arms and say, forget it, you know, I'll go to their competitor, which is also you know, uh, a problem. Now you can get statistics on some of this, but uh, again, usability testing uh, where you actually observe people's behavior can be very effective too. Unfortunately, only really big organizations can do that. I mean, they'll actually videotape someone. They'll have like a camera and they'll watch them and they'll say, here's a list of tasks you should do. You know, go and request a vacation, go and put in an expense report and all that. And they'll watch them and they'll go back later and see all the different things they do and they'll understand that. Right. And I couldn't connect it up with exactly how they put it. So whenever I, whenever I put it in the search box, it actually sent me to the part of their page that accessed the web. Like they were my Google portal. Right, right, so right, like, right. Okay, so I just left. You just sort of sent me out of your... Right, right. You know, I'd rather say nothing here. And 
Right, right. Um, the, the statement was made that in some respects, the wild card in this whole navigation thing is to put in search facility for your site. And again, that's kind of a yeah, but, you know, if your site's not organized well and if your site doesn't use clear language and all that, your search won't necessarily turn up good results as well. You know, I've been to sites where, again, the search is useless. I've also been to sites where the internal search that they provide is useless, but if I go into Google and do a Google search and do a custom search to look for something on a particular site, that I get better results. But, you know, you can't count on people to do that. That, that shouldn't be your plan, you know, first plan, you know, of attack anyhow. So, yeah, the, the, search, the search bar does cover up some of the fuzzy areas of, of this, but, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Not all of them. Yes? Sitemaps can be effective too for, for again, for, for certain kinds of sites that give you a sense. That way you can go in at a glance, get a sense of how it's organized. So yeah. The other thing that, that's good, uh, that, that almost is like a mini sitemap, is when you have um, like the pull down menus. So that when you can go to a site, Here we go. This is what I'm looking for. As I put my mouse over these areas, I sort of get a sense of what's in there. So that's almost like a mini site map, right? So I can kind of preview to see if I'm going in the right direction or not. All right. Again, with with this, it's it's pretty obvious, you know, uh, what sports or entertainment. But again, in in other instances, there might be there might be some blurring of the categories. Um, in which case, um, you know, that, that could be useful. So, what is the end result of the structure phase? The end result is effectively you have a site map. What you've done is you've taken and you've looked at your requirements and you looked at the way that your users, your personas, are, view the information and you come up with a set of pages that you're going to have. I'm going to have a home page, and I'm going to have a page for apparel, and I'm going to have a page for equipment, and I'm going to have a page for shoes, and I'm going to have a page for golf, and I'm going to have a page for softball, for example. All right? I know that's probably pretty hard to see. So when you're done with the structure phase, you have effectively a chart, like an organization chart, that says these are the pages are going to have and this is the way that they're going to be linked together. The next phase is the skeleton phase. And that's where we develop wireframes. Maybe someone has a question. Yeah, I think you have the wrong number. <laughs> All right, bye. Pardon me? No. Yeah, right, right, right. No, they were, they were arguing in favor of categorizing things by color. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry, wrong, yeah. Um, Wireframe. Let's look at Amazon's site. 
and let's go and look at a particular product. All right. If we look at this and we observe, we'll notice that here is a sort of a banner, we could call that. Here is a picture of the product. Here is information about the product. Here is add the shopping cart and so on. As we go down, there's information about it, frequently bought together. Customers who bought this item also bought some more details, reviews, and so on down the line. Now, if we go to almost any other product, we'll see it looks about the same, right? Even if we go somewhere else, and look at a book, all right? Some of the details of the information are different, right? There's, there's not going to be a track listing for a book like there was with the CD. But product picture, navigation, add to cart, and so on. Even if we go somewhere totally different, like today's deal, you'll notice that parts of the page stay the same and have the same layout. What these are, are called, these sort of templates are called wireframes. All right? A wireframe is where you define sort of the skeleton of the page on a very high level. In other words, you'll say something like, my page is going to have a banner on the top. It's going to have navigation over here. It's going to have the content area over here. And it's going to have some footer information like contact us and copyright on the bottom. If we go to LC's page, we'll notice that, or LC's site, we'll notice that The home page has one look, but virtually every other page fits the same wireframe. At least these level of pages. For a simple site, you may just have the one wireframe. Because all your pages, you want to have a very consistent layout. For a more involved site, you may have a couple different wireframes. Because maybe, for example, your home page looks one way and the rest of your pages look a different way. That's a very common sort of um, motif in websites. Home page has one layout, all the rest of the pages have another. Or maybe your home page has one lay layout, the rest of your page have another, and then you have photo gallery pages or, or like photo images that have like a third layout. The point is, is that there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between wireframe and pages, all right? So I'll bet you if we looked at Amazon's site, even though there's a bazillion pages, there's probably three or four different layouts that those pages take. And if we looked at LC's website, even though there's half a bazillion pages, there's probably, again, two or three or four different patterns that they take. So don't think like you're developing a wireframe for every one of your pages. You're developing just a basic structure of how your pages are going to look like. And for your project, more than likely, you'll have one or maybe two wireframes. All right? So it's not as though you're going to have a million of them. All right? Or even one of them per page. You'll have one or maybe two. If you have more than two, you probably should talk to me because maybe your case is unique where you do need more or maybe there's some confusion about the, the correct use of wireframes. The last step 
is the surface step, and that's where you develop a prototype. I want to complete all the steps, and then we'll sort of wrap up things more completely next time. But the idea of a prototype is you develop a working model. You do this for a couple reasons. First of all, you want to get your ideas out of your head and, and actually down on paper and implement these things. All right? And you want to put it in a way that other people can see it. It's one thing for me to talk about someone, if I'm, if I'm developing a website for someone, and to show them and say, this is the way it's going to look. This is the structure of how it's going to look. And here's my wireframe and all that. People get that, but they don't really get that. They get that when they actually see a living page in front of them. All right? That doesn't mean we jump in right off the bat and develop these pages, though. We need that thought process prior to it to get to the point where we can develop some good prototypes. The idea of a prototype is the old run it up a flagpole, see if anyone salutes. You put forth something, and then you get feedback. Either yes is looking good or no, gee. I thought that would be a good way to organize it, but now that I look at it, it doesn't really make sense. Or, I thought that would be a good set of colors, but, oh, on the screen, they don't look so good. All right, so you get feedback. You see yourself, and you can see it in tangible form, um, and you can get feedback from other people. All right. We'll review these steps next time. We'll do a quick pass on these steps next time to make sure we understand each of these steps. And more important than that, we'll look through the example that I have, um, which you should already have taken a look at. If not, look at it either for the first time or refresh your memory before Wednesday or before Thursday. And we'll take a look at my example so it's very clear to you what you need to do for your project for each of these steps. All right? Questions at this point? All right, we'll see you in lab then.